And we begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And g'day. So good to see you. And firstly, before we delve into connected parts of 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and 12, what we modern Christians need to understand is that it wasn't until 1551 when the Greek and Latin New Testaments were published with separate chapters and verses. And then nine years later, in 1560, the first English Bible was printed and it included those chapter and verse divisions. And that is the way we modern people read the Bible today. But the Corinthian Christians and every Christian for the next 1560 odd years read the whole letter in one sitting, connecting the dots between what they were reading with what had previously been said and keeping it all in the back of their minds so they could understand what Paul would be saying later in the letter as he circled back to a point he had previously made. Not only that, but they also understood that the second Corinthians letter cannot be read as a stand-alone letter, for it is possibly the fourth letter they had received from Paul, as it is believed there are at least two other letters that didn't survive all the handling and passing on from one person to the next, as they read and reread Paul's words, so they could really know what he had said. And then it is highly likely that they passed the letter on to other surrounding cities. And that means, at times, scholars have to make a good educated guess as to what Paul is referring to. But here in chapter 6, there is no need to guess. For if you can remember back to the last sermon, Paul had reminded the Christians that it wasn't just him and the other apostles who were called to persuade other people that Christ is the real deal, but how all Christians are given the privileged role of being God's ambassadors, speaking and pleading on behalf of God, as you tell people about Jesus. And so we find Paul continuing with that theme as he reminds the Christians that we are working together with God and we earnestly plead with you, don't receive God's grace in vain. Crikey, what a reality check from Paul here. For if people who have been Christians for only a couple of years can become blasé about their faith, how much more so should us modern Christians who have grown up believing in Jesus as our Saviour take this warning to heart? For quite a few of us don't have that wonderful memory like the Corinthians would have had of ditching their false gods to follow the one true God and his son Jesus. For when we decided that having our parents' faith was the way to go, our faith journey has been this incremental, bit-by-bit bit growth, possibly with a couple of major leaps of faith along the way. And even with the times, thanks to cleverly planted thoughts from the arch enemy Satan, when we have taken a step or two backwards in our faith journey, our faith still has ever so slowly, surely been slowly growing. But along with that comes the problem that over time, without being aware of it, we have gradually slid into a mindset of taking Jesus' death for our sins for granted. And so we forget we are called to be God's ambassadors, showing people how good God's love is through our faith in Jesus. And then Paul goes on to quote from Isaiah chapter 49, verse 8, to remind the Christians why it is important to keep our focus on the job at hand. For God had said, at just the right time, I heard and answered you on the day of salvation. I helped you. Now, your version may have used either heard or answered, which is because the Hebrew word covers both. And so Paul is reminding them that all those years ago, God had, through Isaiah, 
promised that there will be a time when he hears and answers their sin problem by giving them salvation. And the Corinthians could almost see Paul with his head buried in his hands, moving back and forth in unbelief that he has to, once again, remind them of how, I tell you, now is the time of God's favour. Now is the day of salvation. That's what they had heard Paul tell them. That's what they had believed, that finally, after all those years of waiting and waiting, the day of salvation had arrived. Now they had experienced the answer to God's promise of salvation. God's gift of salvation through Jesus was not something to play around with and then chuck it in the corner. Try only pull it out when it suits you, or worse still, Forget that you had received the gift. And how, with the gift, came the responsibility of being God's ambassador and passing on to other people the knowledge of who Jesus really is and that salvation is only found through Jesus. That this is what Paul had discovered when Jesus blinded him. And with that knowledge came the realisation that now that the Messiah had arrived, it was showtime. And so there wasn't a moment to lose to help people understand the urgency of how they are living in the now and that they need to choose whether to accept Jesus as their Lord and Saviour now or miss out on the opportunity that is only available in the here and now. And as weird as it might sound to you, we modern people are still living in the time of now. For like the Corinthians, when Paul first started persuading them that Christ was for real the Son of God, which he proved when he died for their sins and was resurrected. People today think, ha, ah, I've got plenty of time. I'll worry about that tomorrow. And walk away from Paul to be hit by a runaway Roman chariot charging past. Well, yes, yes, okay. We won't get hit by a chariot. Instead, we have an even higher chance of getting hit by a car or bus. But without getting too nitpicky, you get the idea. Once your time is up, time is now done and dusted for you. And now, if you have your Bibles in front of you, the next seven verses Paul will later on circle back to. So I am skipping to verses 11 to 13, as Paul bears his soul to the Christians with, We have spoken freely and opened wide our hearts to you, Corinthians. You are not limited by us, but you are limited by your own affections. I speak as to my children. The expected response is that you would also be open to us. Paul sees himself as their spiritual father, and like a good father, he needs to speak up and let them know where their ideas about Jesus and God are not aligned with the truth about them found in Scripture. Paul, in letting them know that they are failing as God's ambassadors, is not limiting their faith. For if they had followed his advice, their faith would be growing. They are limiting their faith by continuing to follow their own desires and feelings. Paul is trying to get them to see that, just like parents, trying to stop their children from getting hurt by telling them, no, no, you can't do it that way, you will get hurt. Paul is telling them the truth and wants them to stop their sinful behaviour of not being God's good ambassadors. Before they have to find out the hard, painful way. Paul wants them to be amazing ambassadors for God, Jesus and the kingdom of heaven. And in verse 3, Paul reminds the Christians that they know that when he had lived with them, and nothing has changed since he's moved on to other cities, that as God's ambassador, he took great pains to not put a stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as God's servants, we commend ourselves in every way. I don't know if you see it, but to me, 
Paul's opening statement is like what you would make in a cover letter to apply for a job. And so Paul is giving them the self-commendation template of what being a good ambassador for God looks like to apply for the role of God's servant ambassador. And like any job, you need to prove you have a good grasp of what is required, what challenges come with the role, and provide evidence of your personal characteristics that demonstrate you are fit for the job and having someone they can contact to confirm that your actions do match your words praising your abilities. Now, for those of us who find it hard to say how good we are and that we can easily do the job, we may also struggle with extolling how, by our words, people have come to Christ. For you have found it hard to talk about your faith, but then when you look at what Paul lists as his qualities to show he is being a good ambassador for God, you find in great endurance, in troubles, hardships and difficulties, in beatings, imprisonments and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights and hunger, through dishonour, slander, regarded as impostors, ignored as if unknown, dying, beaten, sorrowful, poor, having nothing, not a pretty picture. Who would want a job that advertises this is the brutal hard life you can expect? Clearly, being an ambassador representing God is not as cushy of a job as a political ambassador's where you are whining and dining on the best of food and drinks while hobnobbing with all the big wigs. Like who in their right mind would apply for an ambassador role when you are told that is going to be your lot. Most jobs usually let you find out how tough it really is afterwards. Fair income, even the police force described their job as an exciting and fulfilling career that is progressive, dynamic and diverse. But as Queenslanders know all too well, it was only 12 months ago that police officers were ambushed and two were killed in cold blood, and two were lucky to escape with their lives. Or what about our defence forces, where there is a higher risk of times where you will have sleepless nights, hunger, as you deal with wars, or as you defend our country. And we are all well aware that if you are fighting a war, death is a high possibility. And yet, they ask you to join a diverse, versatile and supportive workplace and achieve your true potential in a professional military capability built upon service, courage, respect, integrity and excellence. And then upon checking, it appears that Ernest Shackleton's famous ad seeking men to join him on his hazardous Antarctic expedition with a doubtful safe return is probably an urban myth. And yet here is Paul describing to the fairly brand new Christians exactly what kind of life he has experienced since he became an ambassador for Christ. And yet the thing that we sometimes forget is that this wasn't a shock to Paul, for he knew how tough of a gig he was getting himself into for he had been a prime mover in hounding Christians, causing them sleepless nights, worrying whether he would come banging on the door in the middle of the night to drag them off to prison, slandering their good reputation to justify giving them the death sentence. And if you think I'm exaggerating, read Acts chapter 9 verses 1 to 13 with its understated bare facts about Paul's behaviour prior to his encounter with Jesus. And the Corinthian Christians knew that Paul wasn't over-dramatizing his life. For in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, he told them that, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And what I have done is joined all the negative aspects into one account, whereas Paul 
being a stickler for the truth, had listed 10 negatives and then given 10 positive aspects of his ambassador work for God. And then he had listed nine negatives with their countering positives. Go read it all later on to get a fuller picture about how both the negative and positive experience you get working for Christ balance each other out. So it's up to you. Which side will you focus on? The awful negatives or the powerful life-affirming positives? And the Christians knew that Paul considers the positive benefits far outweigh the negatives. For Paul rounds off the list with these incredible benefits of being Christ's ambassador, which are in purity, understanding, patience and kindness, in the Holy Spirit and in sincere love, in truthful speech and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand, and in the left, glory, good report, genuine, we live on, not yet killed, always rejoicing, making many rich, possessing everything. Now most of these benefits are pretty self-explanatory, but please note that glory is not about getting glory and praise from people for being a famous and well-known Christian. This is the glory and blessings of hardship that God is giving to you as you perform your role as his ambassador. And the making people rich bit is not financial, but the richness in your life that comes from living and working for God. And Paul in saying he is possessing everything doesn't mean he is getting filthy rich from the proceeds of his preaching. No, just no. For as Paul will go on to tell the Philippian Christians in chapter 3, verses 7 to 8, Whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss. For the sake of Christ, what is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ. And the Corinthian Christians didn't need to be told that Paul is including all those tough times, the people misjudging him, vilifying him, the near-death experiences, etc., as being counted as nothing compared to knowing Jesus. They had seen him live out that unusual perspective of focusing on the positive gains received through Christ. While he was living with them, how he would take their eyes off the tough life they were living and turn their focus on to how they now possess everything they need to be satisfied with their life because of what Christ had done for them. And so if they were called to be a referee for Paul as an ambassador for Christ, they would have no hesitation in recommending him for they knew Paul's word of commendation matched his actions. And now we jump to chapter 12 where Paul starts by literally saying boasting is necessary. And if you haven't read through the letter this would seem strange. But this statement follows directly on from chapter 11 where the Corinthians had read in verses 16 to 18 Paul explaining that what he is going to say next is him boasting in the way the world does. But in this self-confident boasting, I am not talking as the Lord would, but as a fool. And yet again, the Christians would have known that the Apostle Paul was now speaking from his own life. As he explains how he had lived boasting about being a Pharisee of Pharisees. And unless you had lived under a rock, everyone knew how Pharisees constantly boasted about how their Israelite lineage was impeccable, boasting about being more righteous as they look down their noses at those plebs who come to the temple offering their sacrifices and then go on to sin again and again. Boasting, boasting, it never stopped. It was necessary to keep up the facade that they, as Pharisees, were more righteous before God. And the Corinthians 
had read in chapter 10, verse 17, how Paul had repeated what he had said to them in his first letter, that let him who boasts, boasts in the Lord. They already knew how ashamed Paul was of the way he had previously boasted about things in his life when he had really done nothing to earn them. He had no say in being born into his Israelite heritage. His schooling as a Pharisee had been decreed by his parents. And then Jesus had opened his eyes, showing him how thinking he was a good guy because he was a Pharisee was a smoke a mirror's illusion, deceiving him into thinking he was all good with God, when the truth was, he wasn't. His boasting had been pure foolishness. Paul had discovered that the only thing worth boasting about was God, and how it is God alone who gives righteousness to the people who believe Jesus did all the work for them to attain righteousness before God. And so the Corinthian Christians understood that you needed the context surrounding the boasting to know whether Paul meant the word boasting as one, giving glory to something or someone with or without good reason, which was clearly Paul's intent when he called out his boasting about being a Pharisee, for there was no good reason. It was nothing but pure foolishness. And two, at other times, it is clear from the context that Paul is using the word boasting to express how he has an exceptionally high degree of confidence in God and Jesus, or supreme confidence in something God has accomplished that is particularly noteworthy, like Jesus' death and resurrection, and so should be highly praised as God's works. And because Paul considers boasting about God is essential, they were eager to learn which aspect of God's Paul considers necessary to boast about. But then, they hear Paul immediately go on to say, in chapter 12, verse 1, boasting is not profitable. They shake their heads in confusion, questioning, so okay, the boasting Paul is about to do isn't good. So perhaps Paul is going to give more examples of the Pharisaical boasting. But instead, Paul explains, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up to the third heaven. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things, things that a person is not permitted to speak about. Now the Christians were even more confused. Surely that vision is one super impressive, noteworthy God experience. Come on, Paul, we know that was you, that I know a man is a code for yourself. Like when people say, a friend of a friend wants to know. Stop teasing us like that with the merest snippet of information. Third income, that would have to be right up there with Ezekiel and Isaiah's visions of heaven. Surely something like that is worth boasting about, or at the very least, to give someone a no frills account so they too could by proxy enjoy the vision and revelation. And Paul, correctly guessing their confusion, informs the Christians that I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. And you can almost see the Corinthians stretching out their hands as if Paul was standing in front of them, pleading with Paul. But Paul, you haven't boasted. You have left us in the dark about what that man experienced. And Paul, as he dictated the letter, would have smiled to himself, knowing that would be their reaction. And yet he had deliberately let them in the dark. Now many scholars have tried to have a good educated guess as to what Paul was talking about with his vision and revelation, ignoring the fact Paul said it was forbidden territory. This is on a needs to know basis and we don't need to know. We just need to know it happened. 
for the point Paul is making is that yes, this was an incredibly noteworthy, tell the whole world about it, God experience. But as Paul also knows, it is a rare experience. And so they may not get to have a similar experience. And if they do, they cannot compare whether their vision and revelations were better or worse than Paul's, as people are inclined to do. Paul wants them to enjoy whatever God gives them, whether it's an out-of-this-world vision experience or, as Paul also knows all too well, it is far more likely that your God experience will be those times when you, what you are experiencing in your life will bring you to your knees, making you feel weak and helpless. And this thought made Paul reflect as he looked back at how different his lot is now compared to his past life as a Pharisee. Then he was well off, no real health issues, no worries. Oh, well, except for ensuring he kept himself ritually clean and so avoided any of the riffraff to prevent them touching him and defiling him. He had firmly believed he was good with God. And then he had been blinded by the light and had his true spiritual status with God exposed. And it wasn't pretty. And from that momentous moment when he met Christ and gave it all up to live for Christ, how the old Pharisee Paul struggles with how the new spirit-filled Paul considers he has been amply rewarded over the past five and a bit years by having all those terrible negative experiences he had listed in chapter 6 and then in the previous chapter 11, where he had expanded upon those experiences, giving greater details to his hardships, trials, and near-death experiences, the sufferings that had made him feel weak, and yet weirdly, had at the same time drawn him closer to God. And from all of this, Paul knows that at some point in time, all Christians will have a negative experience, or more, that will weaken their resolve to remain in the faith. And the tough times could go on and on for what seems like an eternity. And yes, Paul knows the Corinthians wouldn't be able to make sense of him saying, boast in your weaknesses. But Paul knows, not just from his own experiences, but from their scripture, for the psalmists, the prophets, and just about everybody God called to work for him as his ambassador showed that when you are struggling, questioning, what is going on? Crying out, why me? To God. You are running to him, crying out your pain. And God, like any parent whose child has fallen over and skinned their knees, picks you up, wraps you in his loving arms, and comforts you with words of wisdom that at the time may not make sense. Kisses you better, then dusts you off, and off you go with the sore knee still there. But because of the love shown to you, you can carry on. Now, yes, our adult problems are not quite as simple as a skin knee and won't heal as quickly, and some may never heal. But what Paul is saying is don't look for the happy ending, the quick fix. Instead, boast to people about how God picked you up when you fell and off you went to immediately fall again. And God, without hesitation, once again, picked you up, wrapped you in his love and sent you off, knowing that it takes time to learn to walk in true faith, not the pompous, self-righteous faith Paul had had as a Pharisee, where he had pat answers to people's problems, not seeing or understanding that there were deep issues that he had no comprehension of. But now those years of living hand to mouth, relying on other people, experiencing one hardship after another, Paul could see that his Pharisee faith was shallow and useless. Whereas now he has experienced God through Jesus in ways that he never ever considered possible as God came through for him every time. 
But what Paul knows is that the important main difference between telling people about your visions to boasting about your personal sufferings and weakness is... If I choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain, so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. Even people who know you really well are not likely to believe your vision, but they will believe you when you boast about how God was with you during your moments of despair. For they have seen the struggles you have faced and have wondered, how could you survive what you would be going through? And yes, people do watch how you as a Christian are coping. A neighbor of mine, who isn't a Christian, told me one time that the thing he admires about Christians is that Christians know how to suffer well. And when your friends know firsthand what problems and suffering you have faced, they will know you aren't exaggerating your times of weakness, that what you are saying about how you have only got through with God's help has to be true. For many other people have crumbled and given up under the same pressure. And then Paul highlights another issue that can arise from seeing visions and hearing great revelations as he gives another personal faith account of how to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations. Paul knew from his time as a Pharisee how easy it was to start feeling smug and superior over God's people who were less fortunate because they weren't Pharisees. Remember, all Israelites are God's people and naturally God knew that this conceited pride from his past would be constantly rearing its ugly head, tempting Paul to return to his old prideful thinking and thereby threatening the way Paul could work effectively as God's ambassador. Paul goes on to explain, There was given to me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. And again, people have missed the point, trying to guess what Paul's tormenting thorn in the flesh is. Only one theory has something to back it up, that it was his eyes, weakened by the bright, blinding light. And that when Ananias laid his hands on Paul and his sight was restored, but it wasn't a complete healing. By the way, Paul says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 11, Notice what large letters I use as I write in my own handwriting. The thing is, Paul doesn't want people to know what his thorn is. He won't boast about his thorn. He doesn't want other people to boast about how good Paul was and the way he suffered through his thorn. Paul didn't want people to feel that their thorn is not as big an issue as Paul's. And so they don't turn to God for help to deal with their thorn. Paul was well aware that everyone will, sooner or later, experience a thorn in the flesh that will cause them to do what he did. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. And no, we can't go, oh, that means I can only ask God to take away my thorny, prickly issue three times. If you look across the Bible, you will find, particularly in the Psalms, people who have cried out to God consistently, or people like Hannah, who prayed for years for a child before God answered her prayer. God knows each person and their situation and what is needed for them to seek his help for the boldness and courage they need to carry on despite their awful circumstances. Because we all need to really experience for ourselves what God told Paul. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. This is what Paul has been building up to all throughout his second letter, for Christians to realize that no matter what crap is being thrown at them, God wants you to know that God's grace and power as shown in Christ's death and resurrection is also displayed through you by how well you suffer during your thorny issues.
For as Paul knew, and even I have experienced personally, how the tough, heartbreaking, awful times where God has allowed Satan to plant a thorny message in your life, where these horrible circumstances force you to accept that God, in not choosing to use his power to remove the issue, despite how weak and helpless you feel, you still know God knows what is best for you. For he has chosen to show his powerful love in the way you keep on drawing closer to him as you cry and scream, whatever it is that you feel you need to do for God to hear you. And even though it doesn't feel like it, you continue to choose to believe he has heard you. And he has. And then as we struggle on, we truly learn that God's grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And then we come to that high point of our faith. Then we can join in with the Apostle Paul, boldly boasting as we write out our cover letter, commending ourselves for the role of God's ambassador with. I will gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may reside on me. Therefore, for the sake of Christ, I am content in my weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. Amen.